Hey guys, today we are going to be continuing on with the topic of evolution, looking at the evidence for evolution. As always, please make sure you are filling out your notes organizer as you watch this video. Pause, stop, rewatch as many times as you need to. So we're looking at the evidence for the theory of evolution. Um, we're going to be looking at four main pieces of evidence, fossil record evidence, anatomical structure related evidence, molecular evidence, and embryological evidence. So let's just back up and refresh our memories on a couple of things. Remember, prior to Darwin, organisms were thought to be unrelated, unconnected, and completely unchanged. And the Earth was thought to be about 6,000 years old, fairly young. Charles Darwin was the first to really propose this idea of the theory of evolution by means of natural selection, which really transformed our understanding of the living world, and also made this really bold claim that all species today descend from ancient ancestors. While it was initially met with criticism, the theory of evolution is now widely accepted by today's scientific community. So if this concept is so important, so critical to our understanding of living organisms, this, the, the world of biology, what evidence is there to support it? That's what we're looking at today. Scientists use four main pieces of evidence in order to draw conclusions about evolutionary relationships. They look at the fossil record, they look at anatomical evidence, um, they look at molecular or what's called biochemical composition, and they look at the development of embryos. So we're going to break each one of these down, starting with how do we use the fossil record as evidence for evolution? So definition of fossil, a fossil is the preserved remains or trace impressions of a previously living organism. So this is obviously preserved remains. Um, here is an impression of an ancient shelled organism. Both of these would be considered fossils. So what kind of evidence do fossils give us? Well, first of all, they give us a, a relative idea of when an organism existed. So the age of a fossil is determined in two ways, through relative dating and through absolute dating. Relative dating is just like what it, what it sounds like. It gives us sort of a relative age by telling us which fossils are older and which fossils are younger based on where they're found in the sediment. Um, absolute dating, or what's called radiometric dating, gives us an absolute age of a fossil, when, telling us exactly when an organism existed by looking at the half-life decay of radioactive isotopes. Okay, so in red here is radioactive uranium. Radioactive uranium becomes stable at a very specific rate. So we can look at how much radioactivity is still remaining and determine the age of that fossil. Okay, so looking at how much has stabilized in order to determine how old that fossil must be, knowing the half-life of that radioactive isotope. So in summary, um, we can determine the age of a fossil, which tells us when an organism existed in time two ways. Relative dating, which basically just says used to determine which fossil is older, and that's achieved by using the law of superposition. The fossils down low are older than the fossils in the sediment layers above it. There, those are younger. The problem, obviously, is that relative dating is less precise, but it gives us a, a pretty good picture immediately. Absolute dating or radiometric dating gives us the exact age of a fossil, um, which because it achi it's achieved by measuring the half-life decay of radioactive isotopes. Carbon-14 is a really common one that we use. The problem is that absolute dating or carbon dating is very expensive and difficult. Um, fossil evidence allows us to document the existence of species that don't exist anymore and therefore allows us to draw conclusions about the evolutionary history, or what's called phylogeny, of the organisms that are still alive today. So we have modern horses today, and then we have all these fossils that we found in these different sediment layers. Now, this animal did not become this animal, right? We know that through natural selection, there was this accumulation of traits, and these must have been these sort of intermediate species that led to what we have today, allows us to draw conclusions about the evolutionary history or phylogeny of the horse. Okay, moving on to our second piece of evidence, looking at anatomical structures. So scientists basically compare morphology, which is anatomical structures, in order to draw conclusions about evolutionary relationships. It's as simple as this. The more similar, the more similarities you have in morphology, the more similarities you have in structure, the closer the relationship, which is why we think um, chickens and other birds are more closely related to uh, reptiles than they are to anything else because their morphology is very similar.
Now, there are three types of anatomical evidence. There's homologous structures, analogous structures, and vestigial structures. And each of these types of anatomical evidence tell us very different uh, things about evolutionary history. Homologous structures, remember that word part homo means same. So homologous structures is when you have same structures, same anatomy, even though the function might be different. Homologous structures suggest a very close evolutionary relationship, meaning that they evolved from a recent common ancestor. Here's an example of homologous structures. Human arms, cat legs, whale fins, flippers, whatever you want to call it, and bat wings have very similar bone makeup. Even though their functions are very different, right? A human arm is for grasping, a cat leg is for walking, a whale fin is for swimming, and a bat wing is for flying. Functions are very different, but when you look at their morphology, their anatomical structures, they all have an upper bone, they all have a pair of bones, they all have wrist bones here in yellow, they all have hand bones here in green, it's these bones here, and then they all have digit bones here even in the whale, even in the, in the bat wing. So what that suggests is that these animals must have evolved from a fairly recent common ancestor. It suggests that they are very closely related, which sort of makes sense because they're all mammals. Okay, then we have analogous structure. An, analog, an analogy in like literature is when you compare different things, right? So analogous structures are structures that have very different anatomy, even though their function might be the same. So like a butterfly wing and a bat wing, the function is the same, flight. But when you look at their structure, their morphology, it's very different. Butterfly wings are made up of like thin layers of protein, whereas uh, bat wings you just saw are made up of bones. This suggests that they did, do not share a recent common ancestor. They do not have a close relationship, but there must have been some environmental condition that or environmental stressor that caused them to evolve the need for flight. And then our final piece of anatomical evidence are what's called vestigial structures. And these are structures that are sort of left over in an organism, even though they serve no purpose. So why is it there? It allows us to draw some sort of conclusion about the past history of a species. Um, for example, uh, whales have hip bones. Whales don't need hip bones. They swim, they don't have legs. So why do they have these tiny little remaining hip bones? It suggests that whales must have evolved from something that did have legs, something that did have hips. Scientists think whales actually evolved from a land-dwelling mammal. Uh, look up wisdom teeth and see if you can find out the story of those vestigial structures. And then moving on to our next piece of evidence is molecular evidence or biochemical evidence. This is looking at the similarities and differences in the composition of biological molecules. Um, very simple. The more similar the molecules are, the closer the relationship, the more recent the common ancestor. So here's some, here's some evidence that we look at to draw evolutionary relationship conclusions. We share the same percentage of genes, of 98% the same genes as a chimpanzee. 44% of fruit fly, 26% yeast, 18% of plant. We would conclude from this evidence that we are more closely related to chimpanzees. We share, we share a more recent common ancestor with chimpanzees than we do with plants. We can also look at different types of molecules. So we can look at DNA sequences, we can look at RNA sequences, we can look at protein structures, and we can look at amino acid sequences. So for example, we can look at the hemoglobin protein, which is a protein found in blood that helps to carry oxygen. And we can look at the number of amino acid differences in our different hemoglobin proteins. So for example, humans and gorillas only have one amino acid difference in their hemoglobin proteins. Uh, we have 27 differences between us and a mouse, and there are 67 differences between our hemoglobin and the hemoglobin in a frog. So we would conclude from this evidence that we share a more recent common ancestor, we are more closely related with gorillas than we are with frogs. And then our last piece of evidence is looking at embryological evidence or embryology. So embryology is the study of how organisms develop. 
Again, very simple. Similarities in development suggest a close relationship. They suggest a recent common ancestor. So we look at how organisms um, develop very early on and we draw some conclusions based on similarities. So here's a comparison of vertebrate embryo development. Look at this early, early stage. Very similar all the way around. As we get later in embryological development, still very similar over here. Now we've got some differences down here and then very similar here. So we would conclude from this embryological evidence that humans are more closely related to rabbits than they are and to calves than they are to tortoises, salamanders, and fish, which sort of makes sense. All right, that's all I have for you today. I hope you found this interesting. Um, evolution is a big idea in biology, so I think it's important to understand the evidence that there is to support it. Hope you're having a great day.